What animal has almost 10,000 different species, can be found all over the world, and even inspired a huge worldwide industry? Stick around and you'll find out. Have you ever wanted to be able to fly like a bird? Anytime you want, go soaring through the sky? Tell you what, that's the way to travel. Hi, I'm Julie Scardina, and this is my friend Brisbane. Say hi, Brisbane. <laughs> now, Brisbane is a white or umbrella cockatoo, which in the world of birds means he's part of the very diverse family of parrots. Speaking of a world of birds, did you know that there are almost 10,000 different species of birds? And they can be found living all over the world, including on the oceans. Most of those species have huge populations of individuals at any given time and even spread out all over the earth. That's lots of birds. Now we sometimes may take birds for granted because they're so common in our everyday lives. But you're not common, are you, Brisbane? No, you're pretty special. And although Brisbane here is just a little bit spoiled, most birds' lives are far from easy. In fact, there are already more than a thousand bird species considered threatened or endangered worldwide. And unfortunately, more are on the brink. So what makes birds so extraordinary? What threats do they face? And what's being done to help them survive? Stick around and you'll find out. Right, Brisbane? So what do you really know about birds? You probably know some of the basics that most birds have in common. Most birds can fly. They have feathers and beaks. They build nests and lay eggs. And if that's all you know, you're not alone. Even though birds can be found in just about every corner of the earth, most people still don't know a lot about them. Or maybe they think birds are all pretty much the same. But as you'll see, birds are amazing animals. They're important players in the balance of our Earth's ecosystem, and each species has distinctive adaptations that makes it unique. Birds live in every type of habitat, from oceans to ice fields and everything in between. And in each habitat, birds are an important part of the natural balance. Their very diets alone have a huge impact on the ecosystem. That's because different species of birds eat different foods. Foods like seeds, grains, rodents, snakes, fish, algae, insects, fruits, nuts, nectar, and even dead animals. Just by eating, birds help control rodent and insect populations, they spread plants by dispersing seeds in their droppings, and some even act as nature's garbage collectors. You know, once you start thinking about it, birds really are pretty interesting. After all, their ability to fly inspired humans to develop the airplane. Really? But to do that, we had to understand how birds are able to fly and glide. So come on, Brisbane, let's show everybody what makes your wings so special. See that shape? That's part of the secret. Although flying requires a combination of a bird's muscles, bones, and feathers, the curved shape of the wing is what makes gliding possible. Why? Because the airflow over the curved top of the wing is faster and has less pressure than the airflow under the wing, which pushes the wing up, creating lift. Birds have special lightweight honeycomb bones, too and feathers that create a smooth surface for air to flow across. But feathers aren't just for flying. They also protect and insulate the bird's skin. Birds are warm-blooded, but they can't sweat, so they use their feathers to maintain a constant temperature, around 106 degrees Fahrenheit. Even though all birds have feathers, beaks, and scales on their legs and feet, there are a lot of adaptations that make the different species unique. The shape and size of a bird's beak or bill is adapted to what they eat. Birds of prey have sharp beaks for tearing flesh. Pelicans have a pouch for scooping fish. Ducks have fringed bills for filter feeding. And the hummingbird's long, thin beak can reach inside flowers for nectar. The structure of their feet is adapted for mobility in different environments. Many birds have feet that can grasp branches. Wading birds have lobed toes for stability. And swimming birds have webbed feet. Feather coloration also makes birds unique. Some feathers are bright and striking, 
while others provide the perfect camouflage. Bird nests are highly individual too. There are rock nests, woven hollow nests, and even nests of mud. Birds of prey, like the eagle, make huge nests that they add to year after year. An eagle nest can be as large as a king-size bed and weigh as much as a compact car. Another unique characteristic of some bird species is seasonal migration, which means that birds move from spring breeding areas to non-breeding or wintering areas. Distances of migrations vary, but the longest recorded trips are made by Arctic terns that fly from the Arctic to the Antarctic and back, a distance of about 22,000 nautical miles. As you can see, just surviving takes a lot of work for a bird. And on top of that, like many animals, they face other threats to their existence too, both natural and man-made. Birds go through a gauntlet of threats. Uh, it's amazing when you think of birds that migrate going through storms, going through, trying to go through cities, going through areas maybe where they might be hunted, going through areas where there'll be predators, going through toxic areas, uh, electrical lines, power poles. It's just endless. All animals need a healthy environment to survive, and the only way to preserve any species is to protect both the animal and their habitat. And these days, that's a big job. Thankfully, there are government agencies, conservation organizations, and companies like SeaWorld and Bush Gardens that are working together to save birds and all other wildlife. On June 23, 2000, more than 300 tons of fuel oil spilled from a tanker into the sea off Cape Town, South Africa. Although it was in open water, the spill was very close to two islands that are home to nearly 75,000 African penguins. The spill didn't reach the island shores, but thousands of penguins were covered with oil when they swam into the widespread slick as they searched for food. Immediately, the Salt River Rescue Center was set up, and more than 30 animal experts from zoos and aquariums around the world mobilized to South Africa to head up a massive bird rescue mission. Thousands of additional volunteers also began pouring in to lend a hand. The great thing about the zoo people is what they bring specifically is expertise in caring for penguins. They understand how to get these animals to eat, how to deal with their behavior, and so on. Part of the critical care for the birds was a thorough cleaning to remove the oil. Besides causing illness when ingested, crude oil destroys a bird's ability to stay warm and water resistant. But the process is more complicated than just a good washing. Once an oiled bird is here at the facility, we'll go ahead and start feeding it. Many times it's just a force feeding, which can take a very long process. Then we'll wash them, dry them, and then they're set out to an outside pool where they can go out and swim at any time. This rescue mission was a huge cooperative effort that combined international wildlife agencies, governmental agencies, and zoos and aquariums from around the world. Working together, the animal experts and volunteers accomplished great things. In less than 30 days, nearly 20,000 birds were rescued, cleaned, and released in this massive effort. Crude oil is definitely a killer for birds. But did you know that birds actually produce their own oil to maintain their feathers and keep them waterproof? The oil is secreted from a gland right back here, and the birds shred it through their feathers by preening, what we humans consider grooming. Now let's check out a problem facing some migratory birds in California. The Salton Sea in Southern California is an important stop on the Pacific Flyway for migratory waterfowl. With an estimated 95% of wetlands in the area lost to development, more than 400 species of birds come to the sea and its marshes. However, since 1976, some of the endangered brown pelicans that stop here have gotten avian botulism, a debilitating disease that causes muscle paralysis and without treatment, certain death. One of the rescue facilities for the sick pelicans is SeaWorld San Diego. Over the years, a medical protocol has been established for the pelicans, and veterinarians and aviculturists can now quickly begin treatment. The disease botulism causes muscle paralysis. Um, not every bird has the same problems. Some are so severely affected, they can't hold their head up. They can't blink. They can't even move their wings. What's critical in therapy for botulism is to act very quickly. 
Scientists believe the birds get the botulism from tilapia, one of the fish in the Salton Sea. Every year, SeaWorld treats an average of 75 endangered brown pelicans that have fallen ill at the sea, and they'll be ready to help as long as the birds need it. As you can see, a bird's life can really be a struggle for survival. Birds often need help for other injuries or illnesses as well. It could be entanglement in discarded trash or an injury from a predator. But whatever is wrong, our goal is to fix the problem and return the birds to the wild. So what does it take to rehabilitate birds? It takes teamwork, dedication, ingenuity, and a gentle touch. The Oiled Wildlife Care Center in San Diego, California was designed to care for animal victims of oil spills. But with its high-tech facilities and staff, it quickly became a rehab resource for all kinds of animals and injuries. So after the brown pelicans from the Salton Sea were stabilized, they were transferred here for rehabilitation. With devoted attention and continued medical treatment, even the sickest animals can recover here. And soon the pelicans were in outdoor pens, fattening up with whole fish. After several weeks of rehab, it was time for the Salton Sea brown pelicans to go back to the wild. Did you know that a bird's wing shape is an adaptation of its foraging strategy? Birds like pelicans and eagles can glide motionless, then swoop down and grab their prey and keep on flying. Brisbane, we're not going to let that happen to you. <laughs> but birds in the wild have a lot more than that to worry about. With stretched out necks and wingspans up to nine feet, sandhill cranes in flight are really an awesome sight. It's hard to believe that anyone would shoot such a beautiful bird, but that's exactly what happened to this Florida sandhill crane that was brought to SeaWorld Orlando. As soon as the crane arrived, the veterinary staff went to work. The injury was old and the damage to the wing severe. The difficulty with a lot of these injuries is the severity and the time element that we get them. Often that animal may not be picked up right after the injury and as a result the tissue is able to deteriorate which results in loss of function of parts of the body that really have a major effect on their survival rate. The only solution was amputation, which meant that the bird would never be able to fly again. These are very, very beautiful, and but they're also flighted birds, and they need that flight to uh, get away from predators and find food as well. Uh, without the wing, uh, there's obvious, obviously uh, there's the, the prognosis for a survival out in the wild is very, very low. As it is with some rescued animals, this Florida sandhill crane became a resident of SeaWorld. Once the surgery healed, he joined the park's other animal ambassadors, whose stories hopefully inspire conservation in everyone who sees them. Most times, though, rehabilitated birds are returned to the wild, like this sandhill crane that suffered a broken leg. After only a month of healing, the bird was back to normal and was released near the location where it was found. Okay, Brisbane, now it's time to talk about birds of prey and visit our friend Jack Hanna, who went to a place where people are dedicated to helping and rehabilitating our national bird. The bald eagle is a national treasure, but not long ago, this spectacular bird was in danger of extinction. And although eagles are now abundant in Canada and Alaska, some populations in the lower 48 states are still struggling. Human carelessness is mostly to blame. But thanks to the Audubon Center for Birds of Prey in Maitland, Florida, human care is coming to the rescue. We have three eagles that are non-releasable that are used for education programs, an adult with a cross beak, uh, this sub-adult female that has an injured shoulder, and an immature that has some brain damage from exposure to pesticides. Since the center opened in 1979, we've uh, successfully rehabilitated 218 eagles uh, of the nearly 550 we've admitted. So that's really made an impact on the wild population. But nothing tops the incredible rescue of an eagle egg that fell from an illegally cut tree. It fell 70 feet to the ground. It was still alive. We brought it here to the Bird of Prey Center and gave it to two of our permanently injured eagles who adopted it, who hatched it and cared for it until it was five and a half weeks old. Soon, it was time for the eaglet to leave its foster nest and return to the wild. 
we were able to place this live eaglet into a wild nest where it could be free. So it was incredibly rewarding and it was a, a miracle story for us. Rescuing and rehabilitating birds is a big job, but the rewards can be huge too. What's important is that people are working together to save the species. These efforts aren't limited to rescue, rehabilitation, and release either. There are also projects dedicated to raising endangered birds in protected environments and releasing them to the wild. Light-footed clapper rails are secretive, skittish water birds that only live in the coastal wetlands of Southern California. Only there isn't much coastal wetland left, and what is left isn't very healthy. As a result, the clapper rail has become endangered, and there are only about 600 of them left. That's what makes the light-footed clapper rail recovery program started by the Chula Vista Nature Center really important. Its goals? To restore the salt marsh and increase genetic diversity in wild populations. The light footed clapper rail is one of the birds that's restricted to this habitat. It can't adapt to living anywhere else. Cleaning up the habitat has begun, but it's a slow process. In the meantime, the breeding program has shifted into high gear, and SeaWorld has joined the team to help. By providing staff and facilities to artificially incubate eggs and raise chicks, SeaWorld has significantly increased the number of birds able to be released each year. We hope to use these pairs of birds to breed chicks that we can release into the wild to help increase the genetic diversity. Chula Vista Nature Center is also raising chicks in part of the adjacent natural habitat, and they keep tabs on moms and babies by a video link. So Charles, what we're seeing live is actually the future generations of the clapper rail. Right, these birds that we're rearing today, actually their parents are rearing, in about two months will be released into the different marshes in Southern California and hopefully the light-footed clapper rail will live on and thrive. Hey Brisbane, do you know which North American bird is in the biggest trouble today? No? Well, I'll tell you, he lives in Texas. It looks a lot like a chicken. <laughs> and there are fewer than 60 birds left in the wild. Ever heard of an Atwater's Prairie Chicken? If you said no, you're not alone. Few people have, but maybe that's because it's so rare. The Atwater's prairie chicken is a, a species of grouse, actually. The Atwater's prairie chicken lives in the coastal prairies of Texas and Louisiana, areas that are rapidly becoming developed, a lot like the problem the clapper rail faces in California. But thanks in part to the efforts of animal experts at a number of Texas zoos, the Atwater's Prairie Chicken is getting a new lease on life. SeaWorld San Antonio is part of a cooperative program to breed Atwater's Prairie Chickens for release to the wild. We cooperate very closely with the other zoos that are raising these birds. Um, we share information, um, we trade birds back and forth that need to be, you know, if you need to change pairs for genetic reasons. And when they're old enough to live on their own and the conditions in the wild are optimal for their survival, the young birds are released at the Nature Conservancy Texas City Prairie Preserve, as well as other protected sites. If we weren't doing this, the population, the wild population would probably already be extinct. The Atwater's Prairie Chicken is a good example of a resident species, a bird that stays in one geographic area for its entire life. Other birds are migratory, like the endangered whooping cranes our friend Jack Hanna went searching for in Central Florida. Yep, that's them. Wow. That's, that's two rare, of, isn't it? That's two of the, the hoopers we've got here in Florida. Man. Yep, you don't usually see them quite as easily. Florida fish and wildlife biologist Steve Nesbitt is a whooping crane expert, and his goal is to get this bird off the endangered species list. Well, we've got about 65 in Florida, and uh, there's about another 185, 190 in in the wild out west, so that's it. That's the whole wild population in the world. Gee, oh man, it's a rare bird. It is a rare bird. It's the rarest bird we've got in Florida. Whooping cranes are threatened by habitat destruction and their own slow reproductive cycle. They don't produce fertile eggs until they're at least four years of age, and then they usually have just one chick a year. Combine that with disappearing habitat and normal predation, and you can see why their numbers remain so low. In addition to protecting habitat, 
This project also involves releasing birds from a captive breeding program in Washington, D.C. More than 185 whoopers have been relocated, but only a third have survived. The birds are released at night to reduce their tendency to fly away from the safety of their temporary pen. Each bird is weighed, tagged, and fitted with a radio transmitter so their progress can be monitored. This whooping crane protection and reintroduction program is a long-term project, but it is working, slowly bringing this graceful bird back from the brink of extinction. These are just a few of the projects that protect and propagate birds. Here at SeaWorld, we're also helping endangered least terns and these guys, Humboldt penguins. All over the world, there are more projects and more dedicated people, working sometimes in isolated environments, all because they're committed to saving a species. Sometimes in protecting a species, the work to be done is right in our own backyards. But other times, it takes biologists and researchers to some pretty remote locations, like Seal Island in Maine, home to Project Puffin. A rocky coastline may not seem like a great place to build a nest. Unless, of course, you're a puffin. Puffins are seabirds that live on the ocean for most of their lives, but come on shore to breed and nest among the rocks. More than 100 years ago, Seal Island was home to a huge colony of puffins. But by 1900, the birds were gone, mainly because of hunting by humans. That's where Project Puffin comes in. Directed by the National Audubon Society, the project's goal is to restore the puffin colony to Seal Island. We've been working here since 1984 to bring the puffins and the terns back to the island. The puffins were brought here uh, by bringing young puffin chicks from Canada. It wasn't until 1987 that we saw the first returning birds and they didn't breed here until 1992. Since that time, the project has been very successful with this year's count at 209 nesting burrows. One of Audubon's partners in Project Puffin is SeaWorld. Every year, SeaWorld sends a volunteer to Project Puffin to help them with the research. And it just sounded like something I really needed to do, come and see the puffins in their natural habitat after working with them uh, at SeaWorld. During the breeding season, the Project Puffin team monitors all the returning birds and counts and tags all the new chicks. It is beyond personally satisfying. Um, absolutely learn so much more. And it's really exciting to see that knowing last year there were only this many burrows, but then this year there are so many more. There's only one place to go to find the Andean condor in the wild, the Andes Mountains in South America. Adult Andean condors are one of the world's largest birds, with a wingspan of more than 10 feet. With their long feathers and aerodynamic bodies, these graceful birds can ride the air thermals to incredible heights, soaring sometimes as high as 24,000 feet above sea level. The range of the Andean condor extends throughout the Andes Mountains, but here in Ecuador, the St. Peter Valley is a stronghold for a wild population of this incredible bird. Here also is Condor Wasi, a unique condor breeding program run by Dr. Friedman Kester. Having wild condors in cages like we have here in condor territory is fantastic because once you reproduce young ones, you just open the door and let them fly. Breeding condors is a long process. The birds don't reach sexual maturity until 10 years of age, and then will only produce one egg every other year at best. But Dr. Kester is confident of success. This is a question of time. You have to be very patient. Northwestern Brazil is where we find one of the world's most endangered macaws. They've been found only one place in the world, and they were just discovered in 1978. Then, only 60 birds were found. And now, 15 years later, the numbers aren't that much better. These are Lear's macaws, and they live, nest, and roost in one small area of Brazil. Striking blue in color, the birds are often targets of poachers. And to make matters worse, their main food source, the Lacuri palm, is dying off. And researchers don't know enough about the birds to know what to do to save them. Conservation efforts, partially funded by Bush Gardens Tampa, are focusing on protecting the Lear's nesting sites, 
planting new groves of Lakuri palms, and learning more about the birds. Researchers are just hoping it will be enough to save them. Brazil's Pantanal region is the location of another important macaw conservation project. Cayman Ecological Reserve is the base camp for Conservation International's Hyacinth Macaw Project. Here, biologists and researchers have been working for more than 10 years to save another one of Brazil's endangered macaws. Field conditions for the project are a challenge, which I learned when I joined the researchers to collect data on a hyacinth chick still in the nest. Essentially just a large hole high up in the trunk of an old tree. Once the chick was gently pulled from the nest, we took measurements, weight, and overall information on the bird's growth and health. This chick was about 90 days old and huge. His beak was as big as my fist. When the project started, there were only 1,500 hyacinth macaws in the entire region. But now, due to habitat preservation, community education, and a reduction in poaching, there are about 3,500 hyacinths. And soon, this chick will leave the nest and be on its own. One more bird in the fight to save a species. Brisbane and I think it's really exciting to know that so many people are working all over the world to save birds and their habitats. And you can have a big impact too. All it takes is a willingness to help and a conscious effort to do the right things. So what can we all do to help our feathered friends? Well, for starters, we can put out feeders and watering stations. And if you've got a yard, landscape it with native, bird-friendly plants. Number one is to, to be informed. To look, to go to the library, to go on to Ask Shamu, or to, you know, to go to uh, an Audubon meeting, uh, join Audubon, uh, find out what you can do uh, out there. To help birds that live in or near the water, we can participate in beach and waterway cleanups and always dispose of our trash properly. That's because trash like plastic bags, straws, and fishing line can be a death sentence for a bird that either eats it or becomes entangled. If you're considering getting a bird for a pet, be sure to learn about the bird species before you do, and then realize that it's a lifelong commitment that takes time, patience, and lots of love. Supporting conservation work that protects habitat is important too. It's important that we look at um, migration areas, we look at areas that, uh, for nesting, uh, for food sources. It's important that those areas be identified and those are the spots that we protect. We can also help by building birdhouses or making natural feeders for times like winter when food may be scarce. Be sure to support organizations that rescue and rehabilitate birds. And if you see an injured bird that you think needs help, call your local Fish and Wildlife Service or your local rescue organizations to get aid on the way. Saving an endangered species can be a lot of work, but every animal deserves a chance to survive. And that's why it's important for all of us to protect birds and their habitats. And there are a lot of things that can make a big difference. Don't forget to always reduce, reuse, and recycle. And put your trash where a curious bird won't try to make it lunch. Even though there are thousands of species of birds, each species is special and vital to the diversity of the Earth. Every species we lose unravels another piece of the web of life we all depend upon. So let's give wildlife a chance to survive. It's worth it for ourselves, for the planet, and for the future. Right, Brisbane? Right. I'm Jenny Bush, Conservation Ambassador of the Anheuser-Busch Adventure Parks. SeaWorld Bush Gardens and Discovery Cove are dedicated to the conservation and preservation of wildlife. And we believe the stories, like the one you just experienced, need to be told. Birds featured in this program benefit from the SeaWorld and Bush Gardens Conservation Fund, a nonprofit charitable organization dedicated to wildlife research, animal rescue, habitat protection, and conservation education. Your support to the continued viewing of programs like this is appreciated. I encourage you all to learn all you can about animals and their environment. Remember, we are all interconnected. What happens to them eventually happens to us. 
so we need to protect them. Together, we can make a difference.